I caught in the car down there. Okay. Bomb of Whiskey 3 Delta. That's fine. Yeah, I seem to remember him saying that he yeah. wasn't going to be able to. Ryan and Reese are real champions of, of, yeah. um, of those two activities, get filling yeah. and getting them all. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I think it's uh, something that you have quite clearly shown to the world that there is regeneration happening in these spaces. I've been here a lot of times, and each time I was impressed by the civil society and their vision for the future. And suddenly, the place was shaken up. It faced a very uncertain future. So I've asked Tim Beatley to come. Together we wrote the book Resilient Cities. And resilience was trying to face the big issues of climate change and peak oil, and to do it in a way that enabled our cities to be better places. So we particularly want to see what they're doing about creating a city that is more in touch with nature as part of this transition to being a resilient city of the future. So let the people of Christchurch explain how to build a resilient city, because they're doing it. Your first words tonight were, raise up and on old foundations new signs of hope. That's exactly right. <laughs> Can we expand a little bit about the journey that led you to say that? The, the thing about the earthquakes in Christchurch is that it, it wasn't one big event. Mm. It was one huge event followed by another huge event and mm. on it went. So there was a period of time of enormous uncertainty. So in the midst of all that, there's been a series of losses, which is a bit like the lights being dimmed progressively. Mm. But but what's happened right from the beginning at the same time, sounds contradictory, is the lights have been going on in a much more significant way. And so people who never knew their neighbors got out and helped one another dig out the liquefaction, um, shared water because water was a precious resource for quite a while. Mm. Um, if your toilet was working, everyone was welcome. Mm. And on it, on it went. And so at the same time, there was this sense of impending doom. Mm. There really was a sense of learning what it is to be human mm. all over again. Mm. Um, and so one of the things that I think has been given to Christchurch, I'm a bishop, so of course I'd say this, but I really think we've rediscovered a spiritual dimension. What's happened in Christchurch is we actually remembered that life was important, that life is an extraordinary gift and that other people's lives are every bit as important as ourselves. And by reaching out to one another, we discovered who we were. Mm. Mm -hmm. so, the symbol of the cathedral falling apart mm -hmm. became a symbol of the city and the rebuilding a new symbol. There's a personal cost in that as well as the, the difficult decisions you had to mm -hmm. go through because it seemed to me from the outside you were a bit of a sacrificial lamb that people right. people had to hate yep. or, or, yep. or put their grief onto. Yep. How could God have done this to us? Yep. It's, it's totally unsatisfactory to get angry at an earthquake. Yeah. You don't feel vindicated <laughs> at all. Now a bishop, that's yeah. a different matter. <laughs> but this is a significant step forward, this yes. opening of the building. Yes. This is fascinating because it's made of seemingly very ordinary materials. It's got a concrete floor. It's got cardboard beams and yet it has a sense of soaring mm. uh, you come in your eyes go up but as they're going up to the extraordinary height 
your, your eyes catch the, the cross and the cross confronts you, uh, a, a symbol of suffering but also hope. As you come up to receive the sacrament, as people did uh, tonight, and then you turn around to go out, you see that extraordinary Trinity window. The, the position of this really says it all. We're beside the CTV site where so many died. We're in front of the 185 empty chairs and right out here at Latimer Square were the first responders, the emergency crews from all over the world who came and stayed for about two months. So in the middle of that, you have a cathedral, which is not nearly as grand as the old cathedral. It's actually, these are shipping containers uh, and so on. Mm -hmm. And yet you have a place that is alive and light and hopeful and at the very place which is symbolic of the broken heart of Christ Church. Mm. So I can't think of a better meeting mm. of where hope meets despair and carries us forward. The other thing for us in the sustainability business, this is a very low embedded energy. Yes. It's got a, a low carbon footprint. Exactly it's, were they part of the process of decision making? Very, very much. That's part of Shigeru Ban's emergency architecture, so he's very intentional about that. And um, one of the guidelines that we have made an absolute commitment to is sustainability. Mm. And so we want buildings that do not harm, but actually help the environment. And we're working that out to what that could mean in the future. Mm. And now we've got this place and we will pray and we will receive the strength we need. So. We're just outside the Central Business District on the east side of Central Business District. I wanted to show you a fine piece of carving here, which is a, a wakahuia. It was gifted to the Ava Nortakaro Network, and it's about drawing together of communities of people into one single vision for the east side of town. So it's meant to be uh, symbolizing the creation of a place of a lot of food and abundance. And that depends very much on living in harmony with the natural environment and restoring that environment so it becomes a, a source of food for body, mind and spirit. The most commonly used name in Māori for the river is Otakaro. And Takaro means game. So Otakaro means place of the game. And what we hope to do is turn the east into the playground of the city. We want to see a restoration of indigenous natural habitat in a very broad corridor along the river and interspersed with pocket parks of exotic parkland, recreational facilities on the water and off the water, cycleways, pathways, and enable the communities to reconnect with the river because that's what's being lost. If we were to realise our dream, I mean, it takes a long time to grow indigenous habitat. So it could be 50 to 100 years before you see the legacy left behind. But I would hope to see something within 10 years. Signs, positive signs. The communities alongside the river, the communities that have left it, desperately need to see some hope and new life, a new spring happening here. Light is starting to happen in the CBD. In the residential suburbs, it's probably about two years behind. We're now in the upper reaches of the Avon River. This is the, the main river that goes through Christchurch. The system is a spring-fed system, so there's actually water bubbling up under the ground into the riverbed as we speak. It means there's relatively low flows, but it also means the river is quite sensitive to sedimentation and to contamination. One of the key issues coming out of the earthquake, because of all of the liquefaction and the fine silt that was generated, we now have a system that was already degraded, extremely degraded. There was also the issue of what's called lateral spread. When you have unconsolidated sediments, which is what Christchurch is being built on, if they are on a slope which you have near riverbanks, they move sideways, hence the term lateral spread. So we ended up with a river system which had increased sediment, narrowed banks, and of course, less capacity. So we have a flooding issue as well. Added to that along effectively the whole Avon Otakaro corridor, the land has dropped by about half a metre to a metre. So we have a significant change in both the bed of the river, the width of the river, and also the land surrounding it 
having gone down. Have there been greater flooding events in, in the last couple of years? If you go through the eastern parts of Christchurch now, they've put in some temporary stop banks to try and prevent the river flow going into the suburban areas. But because the land has settled, stormwater can't get away. So you're now getting ponding occurring along the entire length of the Avon Corridor that didn't occur before because the land is now below the level of the river and cannot drain back into the river. What are the opportunities uh, now to, to try to address those concerns? We certainly see that if you've got an area like the Avon Otakaro Corridor where you have land that is no longer suitable for residential development, either because of the liquefaction risk or because of the flooding risk, you now have an opportunity to create a corridor park along the entire river system. So instead of treating the river like a drain, it can be made into a community asset. We would certainly see that there is plenty of opportunity to actually get more biodiversity planting. You can see in this small stretch we have here, the potential opportunity that could be created along the river system. We also need to be looking at the major sources of water quality contamination. Stormwater going directly into the river system and also sewerage overflows are two of our major concerns. If you're looking at getting improved stormwater management, one of the biggest constraints in the past was the absence of land where you could put constructed wetlands to actually treat the stormwater. With the area that's now unsuitable for residential development, we now have an ideal opportunity to create sites for the constructed wetlands to treat that water. It sounds like a tr tremendous vision. What sort of reactions have you had to this? Is it something that people uh, are grabbing onto? One of the first things we did as the Avon Otakara Network was circulate a petition amongst the community. We were able to deliver to Parliament an 18,000 signature petition in support of the overall concept. The work in terms of what the long-term strategy would look like clearly has to wait until the situation facing people who have their homes in the red zone has been resolved. What is amazing is the level of support from those people for a concept like a corridor uh, park that has a broad community asset. And one of the components that we've been looking at as part of the park is trying to retain some of the key elements that they relate to. There has been a plotting of some of the major trees that have been in that area that represent a long-term family history for those people. Trying to record those and incorporating that into a community park we see as being a very valid way of recognising the loss that they have had um, in terms of losing their homes in the red zone area. Interesting. Okay. We're just starting now from the CBD going toward the coast and it's the very start of the residential red zone here. You'll find the roads all over the place around here. Um, and there's whole roads there. Just that's a whole area that's, yeah, that's this red This is zone. all red zone, so this is all to be demolished. Anybody living in these houses? Not, still, um, very few anymore. Very few? Um, the deadline to get out and accept the government offer was last April. Some were given a six month of extension, so you'll see if one or two still around. They're just demolishing this house here on the oh, left gosh, as okay. we speak. Um, so it's ongoing all the time okay. right now. This was a, a street which is a mix of social housing, Housing New Zealand, rented accommodation and owner occupied housing. But it was a beautiful little cul de sac. Um, kids played all the neighbourhood kids from the street here played out in the street, played football and stuff like that. It was a great community feeling, um, but uh, unfortunately that's all gone. So you um, lived here? I lived in this house, house here, and there's a big crack that ran, or two or three big cracks that ran right through our backyard that goes from one side of the neighbourhood right through to the river. And it, that opened up about, oh, so, so big, and was filled up, bubbling up with liquefaction all the way through. Mm -hmm. Nobody could understand what was happening, but it's like, you know, you expect the ground to be solid underneath you, but um, it sort of changed all your perceptions of everything that's the foundation to your life experience. Um, I brought up my family here, so it uh, has a lot of meaning for me and my wife. So that, that house has gone, been demolished, yes. and that, that's what's going to happen. It will happen houses. all the way through, and it goes back about two or three blocks. Um, wow. Yeah, so it's going to be just cleared land. So um, your, your hope would be that something good comes out of this? Absolutely. I mean, that's what's helped us through this whole process of transitioning and moving out, was the hope that we, we don't want to see other people go through what we've been through, so I'd rather see this land turned into a, um, 
restored to its natural habitat and, and become part of a river park that goes right from here to the sea. So I know you've been working hard on this uh, idea of restoring the river. Mm -hmm. uh, you're, you've made a decision. I'd like to hear a little bit about that, that you're, you're going to be like, uh, working full time as a full time volunteer, an, right. an unpaid volunteer, it sounds like. I'm, I'm hoping to get a bit of money okay. for it, but yeah, I've why, given why up my, you do that? something I feel very strongly about. Maybe it's part of my healing process to move myself from here. The river is a source of healing. Yep, absolutely. Yep. You're yep. healing the river, and the, and the river's healing the community. Yep. That's, it's, a, it's, it's, yeah. it's part and parcel of the same thing, and that's very much part of yeah. the Murray way of looking at things as well. C1 Espresso, we've actually been on High Street now for 17 years. We used to be in this empty lot over the road here. And the High Street Post Office is one of the few heritage buildings uh, left in the city. And I can't think of many that they managed to get through completely unscathed. The opportunity came for us to move into this space, which we were excited about because it is it's a heritage place that tells a story like, like we do. We've been around for a while. And uh, we took that opportunity to rebuild C1 in a, in a different way. We wanted to be the greatest cafe in the world and um, to do so we really needed to back up a lot of our stories through um, being sustainable and um, energy efficient. All these, all these things made good business practice as well for us. Um, we wanted to spend some money now to save some in the future. Sourcing of the coffee is one particular way you're, it, you're more sustainable. It is. A yeah, number of years ago we were looking at ways of making our business uh, stand out from the rest and looked at buying coffee from Samoa. Turns out it, it put us on a bit of a journey of uh, planting the coffee, teaching families who are in remote areas how to run a business and their business is growing coffee as well as we've branched into cocoa and vanilla and ginger that we can't grow in this climate in, in Christchurch. But we see Samoa as a local place, it's very close to New Zealand, and a lot of the things that we were teaching over there contradicted our behaviour here, and that, that always embarrassed us how we weren't practising what we were preaching. And the new C1 really enabled us to, to do what we, were, what we believed in by, by getting it right from the start. And, and part of our programme is we work with our staff, we send them over to Samoa, and we bring the farmers back here, and, and we're no longer embarrassed when we bring um, our families from Samoa are here to see the end process with the coffee because we are so so efficient with the stuff now. Should more cafes and restaurants and, and uh, places like that be growing food like you are? I, th I think so. When this garden was planted, we thought this is the amount of produce that we use in, in a few days, but you know we've learned a lot about what you can do with a small area and it just keeps it just keeps giving. With only a little bit of effort, these, these can be real tangible food sources. Previously, you know, before the earthquakes, I guess, um, doing something like this would have, would have, I think, been seen with a lot of resistance. It's a little fringe, um, this idea of, you know, almost like we were, we were a bunch of hippies or something doing this, but now people actually see that this is how, this is how we should be. So there's a new climate, a new, a new acceptance of things. Absolutely. Um, I think one, one of the, the key indicator of that is with, we have solar panels on the rooftop and e everyone nods their heads in agreement to that. We previously, I think solar panels were thought of, you know, it's just this kind of, this out there idea. And, and in a first world country, we were without, um, I mean, at our place we were without food and water and electricity um, and working sewers, we, we realised how um, you know, the, these, these things shouldn't be taken for granted. Well, I know you have some other things going on in the building, including some things on the rooftop. The rooftop is a space we wanted to use and challenge anyone who follows to, to do the same, to do better. We have vineyard on the rooftop. It's an organic vineyard that we transported from Waipara, which is about 45 minutes north of Christchurch. So all the soil and the established vines were trucked out here and we craned them up onto the rooftop and next summer we'll be harvesting 55 bottles of Pinot. There are our beehives, got a whole lot of citrus trees in the infancy, and we're about to start planting tea. So there's quite a bit going on up there. Some, some of it is, you know, the, the produce is for us, but it's also, because the space is limited up there, it's about us telling stories. When we produce the bottles of wine, they're essentially trophies for um, something that people said would be too hard. Uh, they're a tangible, 
I guess, a um, reminder of what can be done and the opportunities that can be taken in the city. It seems to have become the salon for all the creatives here. Yes, I'd like, I'd, like, I'd like to think that we I'd like to think that we used to be in the old C1, but we, there was, I guess there was competition, so um, when people wanted to meet someone for lunch, it was at, at a number of different places. We are the CBD, there's, there's very few things that are happening at the moment, and we've established ourselves in the heart of that. Did we cover all of the, the sustainability elements of the place? I know you were telling us a little I bit think about so. culture and materials and... The, the recycled materials? Yep, so, well, the, the CAF tells the story like through its design, so all the furniture is made from recycled elements, either from the old building or from uh, demolitions around the city. We do a lot of things, like the heat from our kitchen and roastery is reticulated back through the floor, so the CAF actually heats itself using waste heat. The cisterns in the bathroom have sinks above them that you can wash your hands in, and that grey water flushes the toilet. The water supply is cut off um, to the city. Uh, we actually have our own water supply and we have a generator that kicks in if we lose electricity. So the idea is that we're still able to keep running. So I think, you know, a lesson learned for us is we've been closed for almost two years. Uh, I don't want to be closed for another day, not another hour, not, not another minute. So we've, we've set up the coffee shop to be um, self-sufficient. This is the Okiova Community Garden and it's part of a wider campus initiative for the University of Canterbury. Yeah, and there's a, just a big community gardening network in Christchurch, so this is one of 30. A garden will always give back, it will always return something and that concept of obtaining a yield is really critical to permacultural thinking and we're trying to translate that to an organisation and a business which has a strong ethical basis and enables myself and hopefully a whole lot more to keep doing what we're really passionate about and that's yeah making sure this is available and for for all people I guess that's what you call food resilience. Did Christchurch have problems with food availability or food access in the, in the aftermath of the? Yeah, yeah, there was massive damage to the infrastructure and to the supermarkets themselves, which is obviously everyone's sort of first primary source for food. Shelves were becoming bare and there was definitely a, a period there where people were kind of a little bit concerned about where the food was, was coming from. It was probably a bit of a shock on top of the other shocks. That really crystallised my sense of uh, what exactly food security was and what I need to do about it. And my instinct was to sow seeds. I may, I probably was in shock. My instinct was to sow seeds and I was feeling clever about that, but realized that it was gonna take a couple of months for those plants to be ready. So yeah, there definitely was a, a threat and there still is an ongoing one. At a grassroots level, there's a really strong voice, but getting that up into the, sort of the status quo, I guess, in terms of influence, and decision making that's there's a long way to go but places like this are kind of a stronghold I guess so we're lucky to have at least that but today I'm on the fly <laughs> I'll be heading out to a small farm 30 acres just on the edge of Christchurch and we aggregate a couple of different sources of locally grown organic food package it up and distribute on our way home, which is about a 30 kilometre stretch. As demand grows, we have to carefully grow our capacity and adapt our systems to the uh, most efficient way of delivering to homes, but also making sure it's still fun. Um, and financially, it is sustainable. That's the garden city we want to see emerge. <laughs> Here is some metal uh, sculpting. This is a sculpture class that have used the garden as their art gallery. The exhibition is called Guardian, which we love. This idea that gardeners are guardians of the environment. The earthquakes have completely changed the university 
I don't know if you've had a, a look around, but there's a lot of big buildings closed. There's a lot of major work in the pipeline. So we should see some green roofs and green walls and you know, much better cycling infrastructure and things like that starting to take hold. So the whole university can be a live, living laboratory for our students and our researchers. But we've, we've made some progress on developing more of a sustainability curriculum. We've just had approved by the, the University Academic Board and Council um, a new thing which is called an endorsement in resilience and sustainability and that should be up and running uh, next year. Is that in part because of the experience of the earthquakes? Um, yeah, it is. Uh, I suppose what we've done is, is turned that experience of, um, yeah, the experience that we went through with the earthquakes is something that you can't, I, I can't really put words to. It's, um, it's a pretty horrific thing. But um, we've really turned that into an opportunity and starting to see that what happened to us during that time and is still you know, unfolding um, um, has revealed a strength. And so, so yeah, so there is, a, there is a real research strength and kind of inner strength around resilience that we've come to discover, that we've discovered. And so, um, and of course, resilience and sustainability fit together very, very, very well. So it made sense to tie those th two things together through that, through that course and endorsement. After the September earthquake, the first earthquake, uh, we decided we wanted to run some sort of creative project or projects in the central city, specifically where there was one site where our favorite Mexican restaurant had been demolished and people were kind of avoiding the central city. I lived in the central, you know, my whole life was in the central city uh, and we just wanted to run some sort of creative project to spice things up a bit and give people a reason to come back into the central city because everyone was keeping to the suburbs and just going to the shopping malls and didn't have those sort of spontaneous interactions that a, that a city had. So we ran a couple projects uh, on vacant sites in the early days and then after the February earthquake, much worse earthquake, um, five, six months on, uh, a lot of people seemed to turn to us and our organization because we had a little bit of momentum and said, please, will you come to our neighborhood and do with this, do with that, whatever. So we, we kind of became a, a go-to organization, I guess. The Pallet Pavilion itself, there were at least 250 volunteers involved in, in the construction of just that one building. Uh, we have a sort of volunteer mailing list of six or 700 now at the moment. So yeah. A, a lot of volunteer support. I've been involved in a lot of community organizations for quite a while and you always feel a bit bad about asking too much of people and actually the opposite has been true with gap filler organization. I feel always feel hesitant, oh do we really need to ask volunteers to help with it? But actually all of the volunteers feel like they're getting more back than what they're actually giving and so all of the names on the inside are people who donated money. How much did you raise? So we raised eighty thousand dollars, which was we, we raised more, we raised more than our target. People just kept giving and giving. Wow. So what used to be on this site was a big hotel that actually blocked this whole site, so you couldn't walk through from Victoria Street into Victoria Square, and that came in in, in sometime in the early '80s. That hotel was built, and so we wanted to make a sort of symbolic statement that we liked the fact that there was pedestrian entry into Victoria Square from this side of the city. So we created the, the arches here on, on the diagonal to really enhance that, invite pedestrians to walk through and hopefully get the city planners to think, oh, that's a nice idea, maybe we'll preserve that. So we're trying to have an impact on the, the longer term development. The local government has been very supportive and yes, after about eight months of doing things off our own steam and paying for them out of our own pockets. Um, city Council started funding us and we actually now, uh, just last week in fact, secured um, three years ongoing funding through the Christchurch City Council, which is great for us. In an environment where there really is a top-down master plan being enacted undemocratically and 
whether or not that's necessary, I, I'll leave that open. But I think it's really important that at least alongside that, there's a sort of grassroots, bottom-up initiatives that are able to ha have some input. Uh, what projects have been your favorites? The dancer mat would have to be one that I, I'm really happy with. As, and, and again, thinking of it as an experiment, something that you, you learn something from. So we were conceiving some project to encourage people to dance, I don't know, and to, to provide some of that lost amenity. So we created a, a dance floor, like a proper sprung foam under dance floor and put it on a vacant site with speakers and lights and effectively a, a jukebox. We salvaged an old laundromat washing machine, so a coin-operated washing machine, but we ripped the guts out of it and waterproofed it and put in an amplifier. And so you put a coin in and then you plug in your own iPhone or iPod or whatever, and you can play your own music. And a lot of people said as we were conceiving that project, you know, Christchurch has a reputation for being fairly conservative. And people said, you know, Christchurch, Cantabrians won't dance in public, uh, but they do. <laughs> and so the project, you know, was meant to be there for a couple months, and it's now been uh, a year and a half, so, and it's been really successful. And because we can count the coins, it's actually our first project that we've been able to track, in a sense, and we know that it gets used about seven hours a day on average, which is incredible. The, the book exchange, which was one of these really short-term, really cheap projects, that's been totally embraced by the neighborhood. It's now been there for two years. We have virtually nothing to do with it. Basically, the neighbors maintain it, look after it. What about the, the miniature golf? What yeah, about right, so there? this, Welcome. sure. We've started a project that we call Gap Golf, which is actually a, a okay. cross city mini golf course. Yeah. And so this is one hole here, but there's actually nine holes around the city. It's something kind of positive and fun that, that it can do. Okay. And in the process, you, you see a lot of the city. Well, one of our big things, we talk about leading by example, where we try relatively small scale temporary projects. If they don't work, whatever that means, if the public don't embrace them, if, if they're not as effective as we think they might be, they only need to last a few months. They haven't cost so much money and you learn something from that. If people do embrace them, they can last a lot longer. You can do a next version, an, an improved version. And that way we're kind of prototyping what the future city could be. It's quite an exciting city at the moment, isn't it? It is. So I wonder if you might just tell us what is Greening the Rubble? Greening the Rubble is a community project. It's got backing from the city council, but it was created by local residents and has been run by volunteers and now by a charitable trust. Uh, it's, a, it's a fusion of the the keen gardeners, the landscape designers, the people who are trying to make a, a more livable, walkable city, a smattering of ecologists and a few artists. So there's quite a nice mix of, of creative and practical people put together. Well, this particular example on Tuam Street uh, was inspired by the fact there's an Art Deco building across the road which survived the earthquake. So our design theme here, done by an artist called Cara Burroughs, is Art Deco inspired. The, the modular units are similar to ones we've used on some of the other sites. So there's an element of character that people can say, oh yes, that's a green rubble project. We recognize the, 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 the brick-filled gabion basket, so we recognize the metal planters. We've made about 17 of them now. And so each site has a characteristic set of plants or a characteristic artist design or a characteristic sort of trademark. We are trying to make some green amidst the, the depressing rubble of buildings which either are not yet pulled down or going to be fixed like the one behind us or have indeed come down, which is why in this case you've got a blank site, a vacant palette on which to paint. It's a sort of morale booster. It's a project that's helping us to, to use our energy as volunteers to make things happen, to feel that we're not entirely powerless in the face of, of the government bodies and the forces, I suppose, of, of capital and redevelopment that we can't do much about as individuals. So, so we're, we're doing our bit. Because when so much of a city is demolished, you actually have to, you have to find reasons to come back in. So we're contributing to bringing life back into a space that's lost a lot of its life and a lot of its vitality. It's worth doing for those who build it. It's very satisfying. It's worth doing for those who visit and use and the comments they offer, the, the likes they give us on our Facebook page, the messages of support that come in, the donations that come in. They're all indicators that this is 
held with some esteem in the hearts of the local population and also the visitors. Apparently Christchurch is becoming a, a place to visit now because of all these fascinating activities on the street. That's rather nice. So here we are in the, uh, in the container mall. This was formerly the Cashel City Mall. Going back to February, the whole city was um, cordoned off, the whole CBD. No one was allowed in except emergency services. It was fenced, it was guarded by the army. And this was the first chance we had to come back and to see our city. So it's sort of inexplicable really how it's remained popular for coming on two years. It's a bit of, yeah. Yeah, in urban design terms, it's all activated front. You know how shopping centres have no front, they're all inside. This is all outside. Mm. And there's, there's a real attraction to that, so you'd start to wonder if you shouldn't keep it. And it's doing so well at drawing people in. There's so few offices that it's not like people are popping down from their office two minutes. They're really coming out. This is a destination. Are the containers privately owned? And my understanding is that CERA, which is the central government agency leading the recovery, negotiated with the multiple landowners to lease the land, trying as much to get original tenants of the, of the mall in, but as well as new tenants. In many ways, it's just a reimagination of the original mall that was here. How do you think you're doing in terms of the HOPE agenda and particularly the sustainability mm. agenda because you're under pressure just to replace? Exactly. I've always said that if we just um, rebuild the city, we've achieved nothing. If you just put back what you had before, then you will emerge facing the same problems that all cities of half a million people in the OECD face, ageing populations, centres of the city no longer functioning as they once did, the suburban centres suck energy out of it. We have to rethink it. And I, I do get concerned about that. I mean, we produced with our community through a wonderful uh, co-creation project called Share an Idea, a community-driven vision of what we wanted. They came up with exactly, exactly the things that a city needs for the future. We have a chance to do something different. And we're going to have to keep fighting for that because the government agenda will always be economic, get things up and running, rebuild, whereas my agenda and I think the agenda of most people in the city is going to be around reimagining what we are, recreating who we are, rediscovering those strengths that came out of that trauma. And so that, that balance is a difficult one to keep. Yeah. And it's really up to us in our community to hold on to that vision. And in the spaces where the government response does not go, the spaces between buildings, essentially, the spaces around communities and in the environment in which we live, that's where, in the years to come, uh, you'll see, I think, that local energy really, really emerge. And I am passionate about doing the right thing with the city, both with the people, but also what we build. Um, and, you know, I feel very much part of this community. For people to really believe that things can get better and change, it's hard for them, isn't it? It seems to take so long to see anything happen. You know, yeah, it's, it's get... very, very hard because, you know, the scale of the damage we've got here is, is really big. You know, it's $40 billion. Mm. So it's roughly twice the city's GDP. So, you know, it's a really, really big number. It's not like we're this little satellite city surrounded by big cities where people can come in and get everything rebuilt quickly. You know, we are kind of an island. So it's going to take time. And getting some fundamental facilities going quickly has made a difference. You know, the, the house rebuilding stuff is really getting a real, some real power to it, some real energy behind it. But keeping people patient is very, very difficult. You know, we've got a blueprint, which I think is actually pretty gutsy. You know, that's been pretty wi widely... Um, um, held up as being a model by, you know, from academics through to the more sort of property types, through to the people. And, you know, so we, we, we've got a blueprint which does, I think, have a much more interesting, more compact, greener, easy to get around city than we ever had before. The River Park really impressed us. It's uh, something that is going to last for generations and be a global model. Do you think that is likely to happen? Is it, is it going yeah. to be too expensive? Is it going no, to... no. We've, we've got the money. Um, we've got a bunch of people who really, really want to make it work. Mm. We've got a community that want to make it work. And we, we've kind of got a vision which is almost beyond just the aesthetics of a river and buildings nicely around it and cycleways. We've got people who have a vision saying, you know, how are we going to build it so the fish come back? You know, the trout, the white bait. You know, the concepts 
I don't know whether I'm getting carried away, but are, we gonna, am I, are you going to be able to come back in three years' time and are we going to cook a trout together that we've caught in the local river? You know, if we can really go that far, then we've really done something really, really special. And that's the thing here, you see, in an event like this, you can have government doing things, yeah. driving projects, putting up stadiums, all those sort of things. But what it really relies on is other strong institutions out there. You know, the church building a, a temporary cardboard cathedral. The, the arts people building themselves a new professional theatre company quickly, so we can, you know, have got somewhere else to enjoy the theatre. And that's the thing you need, it's not just the government at all, it's about these other really, really important community institutions. Strong institutions really, really count here. This earthquake has really opened up my eyes to what really matters and it's local. Everything's local, that's what matters. Uh, this is the suburb of Bexley. Uh, this part of Bexley is called Pacific Park uh, and all of it is going to be demolished and uh, we don't yet know what its future will be. But what happened after the February earthquake um, straight away was this outpouring of love, you know, from the west to the east. They poured down these streets, the students, the farmers came in from out of town and they just dug out the salt. It was amazing. You know, I stood at the end of my driveway and I just about cried when I saw the students just pouring, literally pouring down the street. I guess that's why I'm really running for mayor, is that um, I think that we can capture that sense of um, competence and self-reliance that we found the community had and make that part of our everyday living. Governments don't have to do things for people. People can do things for themselves with the support of governments. It's a new way of thinking and that's what I'm interested in. The Time Bank at Littleton, yeah. we're going to talk to them next. The Time Bank at Littleton pre-existed the earthquake and I believe that it was one of those community initiatives that led to a much uh, easier response and uh, a quicker recovery. Every community that had that pre-existing social capital they were the ones that recover more quickly and there's a lot of evidence that, that says that is the case. Are there specific ideas about the, the future as you move forward? That well, there, there are a lot of people that look around here and say, well, it's, re it's returning itself uh, to its natural state. So wouldn't it be wonderful if this were the, the full wetlands or part of the pathway from the city to the sea? And, you know, those sort of ideas have really inspired people to think about how Christchurch could take its, its vulnerability and turn it into this magnificent asset. And that's something that I feel excited about every time I look around the eastern area of Christchurch. You know, what happened with the land and its association with the water could actually be the beginning of an eco-recovery that could actually be the economic recovery and the social recovery of our city. Ooh, I like the sound of that. Mm, I like so it too. <laughs> <laughs> this is London Street. This is the main street in Littleton, the suburb of Christchurch. It's the port town of Christchurch and it's part of Banks Peninsula. Project Littleton's a grassroots community group that has a vision statement which is around sustainability and having a vibrant uh, community. We're standing in front of this, the Harbour Co-op. I wonder if yes. you might tell us what this is and the story behind it. The Harbour Co-op started off as a whole foods store. That happened before the earthquake and at the time of the earthquake things needed to change and the built, it was going to be sold as a business. So the whole community got together and bought this. So I believe there's about 170 uh, owners of this co-op now. and. Uh, it links in with a project of Project Littleton which is looking at food resilience in the whole harbour basin and we're using this really like a conduit. So we're trying to establish around the harbour basin sort of micro producers. And at the same time with that project around resilience with food, we realised that the school young people weren't involved. So we've linked with all the schools and early childhood centres, so there's eight of them and we've got a facilitator that goes around all of those schools and teaching children how to grow and how to pick, harvest, 
cook it, serve it, eat it, even how to sit down and enjoy company and how to wash up the dishes and how to put the stuff back in the compost heap, all of that whole thing, so that we have got food security long term, not just for now. One of the other things too uh, with the earthquake is that the powers that be are busy doing lots of things, so you can get on with things. And um, we've planted a food forest here, and you know that you don't actually you ask for forgiveness rather than permission. Uh, you know, for Christchurch post earthquake, this is really exciting. So much space we could actually be thinking of food. So food seems a major focus of, of what you're doing. Food is the first one. Everyone eats, so everyone's connected to it. So that food's the obvious first resilience thing that you look at. But you might look at transport or energy or healthcare, education, all of those things. Now, I'd like to hear a little bit about the time bank. Right, yes. Uh, how has that helped in the recovery from the earthquakes? The time bank is a, um, a way of trading with one another. It's a complementary currency. I do work for you and I get a credit for doing that. And then I can go and buy someone else's time. So it doesn't have to be a direct trade. What it does is it encourages reciprocity and it's everyone's time's equal. We'd been running that time bank for you know, a few years when the earthquakes came. So at the time of the February earthquake, we had the Navy in town and the Army was doing an exercise at the same time. We were really lucky. So in the emergency situation, you had the Navy and the Army, the police, the ambulance, fire brigade, all of that, civil defence, and you had the time bank and they all brought their own skills. So the skills from the time bankers, we knew people in the community, we knew who had what skill. People were still online, that wasn't affected, so we could send out messages saying we needed so many people to help pull chimneys down. In an earthquake or any disaster, people really want to help. People really care. You might think, a lot of people will give you the impression that people are self-centred, but when push comes to shove, people want to help each other. And the other thing I would like to say, it's really love. It's love that we're talking about. Well, it's been uh, a very intensive few days. We've learned a lot. It's been inspirational. The top down and the bottom up, they come together in this city beautifully. And it is the secret to any city as it tries to regenerate and create a long-term future. I was really inspired by the bishop as she talked about her calling and the sense that she had a very special role to play here. And her words were echoed by others. Spiritual words like love and hope and spirit and soul. These were the only words to help to understand the sense in which they were grasping the preciousness of life and how to build a future. We feel very grateful that we were given the chance to speak to people who opened themselves up to us. They want to tell their story. They know this is special what's going on here. Any city can learn from this. This is not just Christchurch's story. This is any city story. This uh, has been a very, for me, a very inspiring uh, several days. I've learned a lot about this place, Christchurch, a, a city that has been uh, tested severely, uh, a community that has come together after these events and uh, is becoming a stronger place. I'm very impressed uh, with the, the emerging vision of what this city could be. Remarkable efforts. Oh, the opportunities are endless and the learning, like so much stuff to learn that I would never have seen before if I wasn't here because of the earthquake, yeah. No, I love it. I loved it before the earthquakes and I love it now, so.